It's awesome to worship. Just to be able to sing praises to our Lord. It's awesome to see teenagers sitting over here with their hands raised up, with their eyes closed, not worrying about what somebody thinks of them, but just wants to worship the Lord. Today I have a topic that many of you will say, I, I needed to hear that. And some of you will say, every time I go to church, he talks about it. But it's a topic that controls every one of our lives. It's a topic that if we do not communicate what that topic is and what God wants for us, we are going to be stuck in the same deja vu style of our monetary gain. Because God has given us a principle in the Word of God. And that principle in the Word of God is not financial gain for self. It's trusting in God in everything that He has given to us and for us. And I want to use an illustration I've used many times, but I want to use that illustration off of a kickstart into the sermon because what Jesus does for us is exactly what I did for my son. We were at McDonald's, and my boy was about six years old. His name is Bryson, and, and uh, he loved McDonald's. And I was, I was on one of those kicks that I was, like every six months I get on a kick, I need to lose some weight. So I get on that kick for about two days, and uh, that kick wasn't any fun, so I get off the diet. But I was on that kick at that time, so I got me a, a chicken salad. And I was eating my chicken salad, and Bryson got him his uh, Happy Meal. And, uh, you know, that, those fries in that Happy Meal, they look so good. So I was eating this nasty chicken salad and thinking I'm going to lose 20 pounds in two days. And I looked over, and I saw that fry in his Happy Meal. And I reached over, and I pulled out one of those fries, and I began to eat it. And he looked at me, and he got mad at me. He said, those are my fries. I said, they are, are they? So I reached over and got a couple more fries out of his bag, and he started getting mad. So he took the fries, and he held them in his hand, and he started eating all those fries. And I said, dude, I've been sitting over here eating a chicken salad. He goes, you can go get your own fries. I looked over at him, I said, son... Can I tell you something? You have those fries because I gave those fries to you. Do you know that? Do you know, Bryson? I could go up at that counter and I could buy all the fries they have in this store. I have my credit card. I may have to pay for it for three months, but I can get all the fries I want and you cannot have any of them. And he held on to his fries and he didn't want me to have any more of his fries. And I want to teach him a lesson. So I went and got me some fries. <laughs> I was on a diet, but I got those fries. And I started eating those fries. I ate so many of those fries, I was almost sick. But here's the principle. Your stuff are your fries. You didn't buy those fries. God gave to you what you have because he wants you to have that. And sometimes we hold on to our fries so much and God is saying, you know what? If you give me a fry, I could baptize you in fries. But so often what we do is we want to hold on to our stuff. And our stuff is our stuff. And we're telling God, leave me alone. And you know what he does? He leaves you alone. You have it. That's what you want. That's what you work for. There you go. But if we're not happy where we are spiritually, if we're not happy where we are financially, here's the principle that God wants to teach us today. It's not about what we have. It's what we do with what we have. Because if what we have is ours, 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 and no one else's, it's all about me, God calls somebody, Jesus says God calls us a fool if all we do is focus on finance, if we live for our money, our money is our focus. Our drive in our life is to gain resources and be selfish with them, then he calls us a fool. Now, there, are, there is nothing wrong with finances. There's nothing wrong with having resources. I, I'm firm believer that God honors us when we have a work ethic, we work, we gain resources. It's not about having money. It's about what you do 
with the money that you have. And I want to prove that to you today. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus was teaching thousands of individuals. Some were his disciples, and some were his followers, and some even were his enemy. And they didn't follow, they didn't like him, they were just trying to find something against him. And he was up teaching. And in his break, in Luke chapter 12, there was two guys that wasn't paying attention to what Jesus was teaching. They were there for Jesus to be a judge or an arbitrator, if you would. So they waited for a break. And when Jesus took a break or took a stop in his communication, they, they chimed in and asked him a question. And I want to catch that in verse 13 of Luke chapter 12. It says this. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me to be judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Here's the myth that's getting busted right now. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground had a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I'll store my surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves and is not rich towards God. If all we do is think of ourselves and we don't think of what God wants for us, then God calls us a fool because we're prioritizing our life over God's will. The idea that we have today, your resources, whether you make $15,000 a year or you make $150,000 a year, we're all on the same playing field. It's not about the amount of money you make or the amount of wealth you have possessed. What happens is the heart that has you. The condition of the heart is the matter of what we do with the information that we have. And when we have a condition of the heart, here's what we need to do. We have to understand there's some principles that we have to give, and then there's some application. So here's the basic principle that he said to them. Jesus replied, man, who has appointed me judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on guard against greed. Now, I understand what greed is. There's always things that we're greedy for, things that we want to have. And he says, guard your heart. Out of the heart come all the wells of emotion that we have. It's the seat of emotion. Guard your heart. In other words, if I don't watch my heart, my life can fall out of control. My heart, the thing that I desire, the thing that I want, if it is not godly, what we do is we start greeting, being greedy over things that God doesn't necessarily want us to have. And then if we start having greed over things that God doesn't want us to have, we start leaving God out of the very thing that God gave to us. And that's greed. And he says this, life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. See, sometimes we feel like the one that has the most is the most successful and the most popular or the one that God blesses the most. And sometimes God gives to us things, but he also expects things. When we expect things, we can't guard our hearts if we fill our life with possessions for myself, for greed. And when he tells a parable, he says this. He said, guys, I want you to listen to this. This is not just these two guys that he's talking to. He's talking to thousands of individuals. And he says, guys, finances can ruin your life if finances is all you care about. Don't worry about gaining things if you don't have a relationship with God. He said, what good does it do if you gain all the process of all the possessions of all the wealth, but yet you aren't rich towards God? You know, when we have a lot of people in the hospital, and uh, I went to see my mom yesterday, and you know, you know when people get older, uh, 
They spend a lot of money on health care, don't they? We write checks all the time on health care. And here's what my conclusion was. My mom worked her entire life to gain wealth. She's not a rich woman by any means. But she worked her entire life until she retired to gain wealth. And since she has retired, she has spent all of her wealth to gain health. And it's not working. Sometimes we spend all of our money and all of our resources and all of our time. And sometimes we just don't have enough wealth at the end because our wealth is nothing to this world. What's more important than any monies that you could have is your relationship towards God. And the Bible says God would call you a fool if all you cared about is how much money is in your account. Now, I, I believe we ought to take care of our bills. I believe we ought to take care of our retirement. I believe we ought to take care of our families. And I am not saying we should not because it is God's mandate that we do what God has given to us and be responsible with our resources. But on top of that, it is our responsibility to be wise with our resources and be rich towards God. We must be rich towards God. In Matthew 5, it says, But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. When he says, thou fool, you shall be in danger. When God uses the word fool, it is a powerful, powerful thing. It is saying this, I know everything about your life. I know everything about your resources. And you are foolish if you think your resources are going to get you to heaven. You are foolish if you think your resources will keep you happy. We have watched in the news over the last few weeks, or last week anyway, of a, a man that was a phenomenal, phenomenal golfer that's worth millions and millions of dollars. When his life spiraled out of control, you know what those millions of dollars did for him? Jack squat. Tiger Woods is in misery. Mentally, emotionally, physically, he's miserable. Could he write a check to pay for anything he wanted at any time? Absolutely. What good is money when you're out of control? When your life is foolish? So God says we need to guard a few things. And here's what foolishness looks like. When we focus on our resources more than anything else, he calls us foolish. Number one, equates material abundance with success. When you think that the more I have is the more people will think I'm successful, so they'll respect me more because I have more things. In Jesus' economy, it was an agriculture-based economy, which means when they... When they paid for their crops and the crops came in that's when they would sell their crops and they would gain those resources about once a year and then that crop gained resources and this farmer got his pride because he had a bumper crop because the land was perfect because the sun was perfect their water was perfect and I want to ask this guy did you do that you planted the seed but God gave the increase. Sometimes when we look at our life, when we look at what God has done, we can say, look at what I have done. But in all of our life, what we have to do is look at what God has done. What God has blessed me with. The Forbes magazine is going to come out and they give us the top 10 richest people in America. And they come through every year. Every one of those top 10 rich people, they have millions and millions and millions of dollars. And they have a name for themselves. And they've done well for their life. But what good is the money, what good is the fame, if they do not become rich towards God? And this man, this man, had plenty of resources. But he was lost the priority. It is said, money can't buy happiness. But it's also said, money can't buy happiness, but at least you can choose how we're going to spend our misery. I can do a lot of things with resources. 
I can go where I want to go. I can do what I want to do. I can have what I want to have. And we can spend our time for a very short time being very happy financially. But being happy financially without being happy spiritually is at the end foolish. Because at the end of our life, I'll use another illustration. Tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock, I have a, a funeral for uh, Daisy High, one of our charter members of our church's son passed away last week. And um, that funeral's tomorrow at 3 o'clock. He was saved when he was six years old at Glenville Baptist Church. He walked away from God. And even when he walked away from God, about every two or three months, there'd be a check in the mail from Ray High. Just a check, two, three, four hundred dollars. You're saying, gift to the church. See, even when you gave your life to Christ, there's something within our soul and within our life that we say, I want to honor God. I may not be living for him, but I'm thankful for what he has done. You know, when he was six years old, you know what took place within his life? He was adopted into God's family. What does that mean? That means when he was six years old and he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, Jesus wrapped him up. He took him by the arms and he placed him into his family and he held guard against him. Everything that he did, every sin that he committed was on the blood of Jesus Christ. Ray, being older now, and passed away. I'm going to stand and I'm going to preach his funeral. And I don't have to worry about the sin that he committed. You know what I get to talk about? When he was six years old. And the adoption that God gave to him. What is the priority? The priority is what we have done is, is important. But who we have, being rich towards God, is definitely what God has in store for us. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verse uh, 20, Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, righteousness to the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. It's not about how much money you have. It's about the condition of your heart. The second thing, a fool demonstrates self-centered attitude. A self-centered attitude. My money is my money. My resources are my resources. Before September 11th, it was called that we were the me generation. After September the 11th, it said that we have turned to the us generation. Well, now it is said that we are the give me generation. Give me, give me, give me, give me. We look at the government and we look at all the programs that our country is going broke because of. What we have to do is we have to change from the give me generation to the love me generation. But Luke chapter 12, verse 17 Listen to the personal pronouns. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build bigger and greater. There I will store all my crops and my goods. Has nothing to do with thank you, Lord, let me give back to you what you blessed me with. It's all about the self-centered attitude of mine. In the space of 47 words, he had a total of a personal pronoun of I, me, or my 10 times. Almost the fifth of every conversation he had, he talked about how good he was or what he did with what he had. In Proverbs 28, 26, who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Sometimes we have to take our eyes and say, who's in need? 
What does God want me to do for him, for the body of Christ, for other people? And when we take our eyes off of what I have and put my eyes on what God can do for me and with me, we change everything. One of the saddest days, I believe, in the last few years, especially in this area of the world or this area of the United States, was the Oklahoma City bombing. And Timothy McVeigh drove his truck through the city of Wichita down to Oklahoma City. And he bombed the federal building. Very sad day. They arrested him and they put him to death in the electric chair. You probably remember that day. Do you remember his last words that he said? He said this. From a poem, he said this. I think whatever gods may be for my uncontrollable soul, in the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody, but unbowed. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. Here's the last part. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. A 15 second pause. A prayer. And then death. And the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for those that know him. But it also means when he closed his eyes, he realized he was not the master of his fate. And he realized he's not the captain of his soul. His head not bowed and no more cry. Timothy McVeigh did never acknowledge that Jesus loved him and that Jesus wanted to forgive him and that he needed that forgiveness. We are never the master of our own fate. And we're not the captain of our own soul. When we think selfishly, we think that I am in control. If I have, I am blessed and I'm good enough. But God says, no, that's not right. You can have everything, but if you're not rich towards God, you have nothing. The third thing, a fool estimates that more wealth will reduce stress. <laughs> Anybody have that problem? The more stuff you have, it causes stress. It causes those issues. What we have to do is we have to understand that when we look at what God has blessed us with, when we realize this, this is the main point. Your stuff is not your stuff. God blessed us with it. As we realize in the last 10 years, it can be gone tomorrow. The stock market may crash. Investments go south. The thing that you thought you had for retirement is gone. Like that. Well, we have to realize more stuff does not reduce stress. He said this in verse 19. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, don't worry about anything. Just live off of your income. Don't worry about helping. Don't worry about serving. Just think about yourself. Think about the lottery winners. I watched a documentary on the lottery winners. They're very happy for a period of time until the money is gone and the stress sets in. Some of the multi-million dollar lottery winners are in worse shape five to ten years after they win that lottery. Now, I will say this. If you do win the lottery, the church, you tithe it, the church will be paid off, and, and I'll pray that you don't go through all that junk, but <laughs> we could use that. The Romans had a proverb for reducing stress. Money is like seawater. The more you drink, the thirstier you get. The more you have, the more we want. The more I accumulate the more I feel successful. And we gain success when people look at us differently. And we get our high financially because the, the, the power that we gain when we feel we have resources. And that is pride. If we gain our pride because of our resources, if we get our identity because of the money that we have in the bank, 
we have lost the priority that God has. God doesn't want us to get our priority out of our, our position in this earth. He wants us to gain our position and our identity in what Christ has done for us. We shall gain nothing. We shouldn't glory in anything except for what Christ has done for us. When we close our eyes and we take our last breath, God cares less about how much money you have made. Well, God cares of what you have done with the money that you made. If we have all the money in the bank, but we haven't served and we haven't helped and we haven't been rich towards God, your family may like it because they get an inheritance. But God is saying, use the money that I've given to you wisely. The richest man in the Bible was Solomon. Solomon was the richest man that had ever lived. At the time, he had multiple, multiple, probably millions and millions of dollars at his age, in his time. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, he says this, Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward for all of my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done, and on the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity, and grasping at the wind, there was no profit under the sun. In other words, when he was ready to die, he looked back at his life, and he said, it didn't mean anything. All the pleasures that I indulged in, all the resources that I had, it's like a boxing match in the wind. It doesn't do anything. What makes a difference is when I close my eyes, am I towards God? Do I have that loving relationship? I don't want to regret my life. I want to look forward to my life. One of the first billionaires that the United States of America ever produced was um, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes owned his own airline company. And do you know what a billion dollars looks like? They rolled out the Gerald Ford aircraft carrier this week. Do you guys hear how much that cost? $12.5 billion. Let me tell you what a billion dollars looks like. You would have to spend a billion dollars by doing this. Spending 1000 per hour. 365 days a year for 100 years without gaining interest on the original $1 billion. A thousand dollars. I'd like to try that for just a while anyway. That's a lot of money. Imagine. Job 5, 7 says, Yet man is born to trouble as sparks fly upward. Howard Jews was worth a billion dollars. He died his last two years of his life in an upper room of a hotel, scared to death of disease, died alone, died rich. He was foolish. What good is money if you do not have a proper perspective on it? And the fourth point, miscalculates the length and the meaning of life. Our farmer did not understand. He had all the resources at his disposal. Verse 19 says, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. But God told him, <laughs> You do have plenty of grain. You do not have a lot of years. He said, Tonight, your soul will be required. Sometimes, we look at life and we think that we have a lot of years ahead of us. Somebody was joking with me, um, uh, Mike Palmer, where's Mike at? He's probably walking outside eating a donut. Probably, no, there he is over there. Um, he stood right back here and he said, he said, he said, how old were you this year, this week? I said, well, I turned 54. He goes, man, he said, that goes in a hurry. I'll be there in a short time. I said, Mike, I was your age last week. When you get to be my age and white-headed, Man, time flies. 
And I'm going to be as old as Brenda Lane like in the next week or so. I'll be like 90 years old or something like that real quick. But, you know, it, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> oh, I'm in trouble. No, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Some people's mo motto is live life like there's no tomorrow. Just do what you want to do. In James 4.14 it says, Whereas do you not know what will happen tomorrow? For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Let me give you the grasp on that. You ever walked outside when it's cold? And do you see your breath? And that breath is the vapor of your life. And you see that vapor coming out of your mouth. And then it's gone. Here's what Jesus is telling us. Our life is as a vapor. It lasts for a second. And then it's gone. In lieu of eternity, our 70, 80, 90 years of age is like a vapor in the scope of eternity. It's kind of like you had a bad day. You got up and you driving to work and you got a ticket. You're driving seven miles over the speed limit and you're driving down the street and you get pulled over and um, I got pulled over right over here in the parking lot of the church <laughs> on, a, on a Wednesday night and um, I was, the cop just pulled me over because I made a wrong turn and, and I said, hey, could we do this someplace else? He goes, nope. Nope. I said, man, I pastor this church. He said, good. <laughs> I said, oh, that's embarrassing. But you get, you, you, uh, get pulled over and, and you got a ticket. And then you go to work. You're late for work and your boss gets mad at you because you're 15 minutes late for work because you got a ticket. So you call the ticket place. You find out the ticket you just got is 125 bucks. And you don't make 125 bucks at work all day. So your day is like wasted. And then you go to bed at night and you got in a fight with your wife because um, you told her that the food wasn't any good and, and you just had a bad, bad day. Terrible day. And then the week goes by and a month goes by. Guess what happens? The first day of that month, you really don't remember because it happened so long ago. And when you die and you're going to look into heaven, and you're going to take these 70 years, and you're going to be just like a day of those 70 years. Oh, it started bad. But now you gain access to heaven. And you're not going to remember that day, nor are we going to remember this life. Because our body and our mind is going to be a perfect mind. So what Jesus has told us to do, he said, the church, the Christian, your job, is not to think of yourself. Your job is to think of others. To be rich towards God is this. Not to accumulate things for yourself. But what you do with your resources is to reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. To do what you have to do. In Matthew chapter 6 verse 19, in the paraphrase of the Message Bible it says this. Do not hoard your treasures down here where it gets eaten by moths or corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasures in heaven where it's safe from moth, rust, and burglars. The place where your treasure is is the place that you will most want to be and you'll end up caring and loving the place where you send your money. When you buy a home, the realtor will say, what's the most important thing? Location, location, location. Where you spend your money? Location, location, location. It's a fool to not think about eternity. It's a fool to think you have your resources for yourself. It is God's call, he said, to be rich towards God. So, we start talking about fries. Are we happy with the fries that you have? Are you happy with your financial situation right now? 
If I was a financial investor and I gave to you advice about your finances and I'm giving you advice from the spiritual perspective of your finances, not the worldly perspective of your finances. You go try to buy a car and you're tight with your money and you say, well, what, what, what can I give up? They'll say, hey, you spend whatever it is, $15,000, $10,000 a year given to a nonprofit organization. If you cut that out, you could have this car. So you always look for ways to cut out and you always cut out what God wants you to do. But I'm telling you the other side of that. I said, when you give God what he has asked for, he is baptizing you with his blessings because he trusts you. Because here's the deal. If God can't trust you when you make 50000 to give back to God what he has asked you, God is not going to bless you with 500000 God is going to give you and bless you according to his trust and according to what he sees. Being rich towards God means I want God to take care of me because I honor him. When we honor him, he does great things. He honors us in many ways. That foolish man that Jesus talked about, he was full of pride. I do not want to end my life. And I don't want to stand before God. And he says, Bruce, you were a good preacher. You took care of people well. You ministered to people and you visited people in the hospital. But man, you're foolish. You thought the resources that you had was yours? No. They're not yours. There's not a staff member and there's not a deacon at this church that does not systematically give and tithe to this church. Because you cannot be in leadership of the church unless you're our first doing what God has asked you to do. And that's to systematically give towards him. With a smile, not a grudge, not looking at what I have to do. It's looking at this, that God blessed me. He honored me in everything that I have. And this church does one, I mean, you take care of me uh, beyond measure. And I'm very thankful for that. But this is God's house. And I understand that God could take away whatever you have blessed me with. Not the same as he could do for you. But what we have to do is we have to say, Lord, thank you for what you've done for me. Allow me to bless others with what you have. <laughs> I was talking to somebody just yesterday about this, the aircraft carrier. $12.5 billion. And that's a lot of tax money right there, isn't it? But you know how we get that $12 billion tax money? Everybody in the United States pays their fair share. I wish it would be that way, but a flat tax or whatever the case is. But, but if everybody pitches in, everything can be done. In our church, it's the same way. When the body of Christ says, I want to be rich towards God, the first and foremost thing is I want people to see Christ. I want the church to be blessed so the people can see Christ so people can get baptized, lives can be changed, and events can take place. The body of Christ. The body of Christ right here under Glenville, the purpose of the church is not to meet on Sunday morning. The purpose of the church is to reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. It takes resources. And Jesus has one plan for the church. To be funded through the people that have been radically changed by the church. When the church is radically changed, when people are changed, when people have a passion for Christ, when people want to be rich towards God, the church grows financially, numerically, and spiritually when the body of Christ says, I'm in. When the body of Christ says this, I like what the church is doing. I like when the church is winning people for Christ. I want to be part of that endeavor. When the body of Christ sees 70 kids going to camp, I want to be in that endeavor. When the body of Christ sees kids getting saved, 
People worshiping. Marriages being transformed. Lives being changed. Addictions becoming clean. When we see what God can do through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the body of Christ, we need to say, all in. When we see people's lives that are destitute, we see marriages falling apart, we see addictions controlling people's lives, and they come for guidance through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the body, through the church, and their lives are changed, I want to be all in. When we become all in in people's lives, we realize this, my life is not good. God is good. And God wants to use whatever I have to change people's lives. I do not want to see God. And he says, Bruce, you are foolish. I don't want my life to be foolish in any area. I want God to be honored. With my wallet, with my life, with my family. I want God to say, well done. That good and faithful servant. I want to see what God has done with what I've given to him. And see, God takes great records. And the Bible says nothing happens down here that God doesn't record. And everything that we have done, we sent to heaven. And God has recorded everything that we have sent to him. There was an old illustration I'd like to close with. This man gave his life to Christ. And, and uh, he knew that he was adopted. He knew he was going to heaven. And he died one day. And th this is the story, so I'm going to not be theologically correct. And St. Peter welcomed him at the gate, and St. Peter took him through the pearl gates, and he walked him down the street, and uh, he went over to this little house. And this little house he walked into was a one-bedroom house that didn't even have indoor plumbing. It had holes in the roof and no carpet on the ground. And, and he goes, whoa, time out, dude. Where's my mansion? As last week we know it's a room, but we're going mansion this week. Where's my mansion? And St. Peter says, we only built what you sent up with. If you don't send any money, I can't build your house. If you don't send, I, I, I thought it was stupid too, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> Our resources are very important. To honor God and love him, let him take care of our life.